the asterisk outlet obstruction, which is a condition that the the pyloric antrum or the gastric outlet is basically obstructed by whatever the reason is, it could be due to cancer, and so that's from the inside, or a fibrous peptic ulcer, all right? So there are the two common causes for gastric outlet obstruction. However, it can be due to anything else, whether it's a tumor from the outside, uh, or maybe even um, a pseudocyst in the pancreas as well can lead to that. So we have a 45-year-old female patient presented with vomiting uh, and also epigastric fullness, which sounds typical for this, for this condition, which is gastric outlet obstruction. The lab findings shows hyponatremia and pH is 7.5. So in this one, we're going to focus on a few things related to electrolyte imbalance in this particular condition because as you notice that the patient has significant vomiting which means significant loss of lots of electrolytes, including sodium and also potassium and chloride, and um, more importantly, hydrogen as well. So we do have what are the causes of this clinical picture. So it can be whether it's a, a benign condition, and the benign condition is chronic peptic ulcer disease, and a malignant condition, which could be a gastric carcinoma or a pancreatic carcinoma, and you can also think of pseudocyst as well, which we explained in the acute pancreatitis session. The ABG find findings, as you can see from here, it's hypokalemic, hypochloremic, metabolic alkalosis. The biochemical abnormalities, the normal biochemical abnormalities in those patients is hypochloremic, hypokalemic, uh, metabolic acidosis. So hypochloremia, it happens due to loss of chloride and vomitus, and hypokalemia, it happens due to increased aldosterone secretion and we're coming to this in detail. The bicarbonate is, I mean, so, so if you remember when we talked about the blood pressure management in the, pre the previous video as well, so we explained the release of aldosterone uh, by activation of phrenin alder, uh, angiotensin aldosterone system. And we mentioned that aldosterone um, can uh, lead to salt and water retention. But we always need to complete the sentence. When we mention salt and the water retention, if you're retaining something, you have to excrete something in return as well. So that will be alternating between the hydrogen and the potassium. So the patient can have an acidoria, the patient can have acidoria, and also hypokalemia, unless they are taking you know, any uh, potassium is perindiuretic. But obviously, this is the basic physiology of the body. There is aldosterone production in case of hypotension, such as vomiting or dehydration or anything like that. And this will consequently lead to salt and water retention in exchange with hydrogen and potassium. So bicarbonate will be normally increased um, because there will be increased reabsorption of the bicarb in the renal tubules as well. Uh, in response to loss of chloride, um, and this basically happens in the thick ascending part of lobe of Henle. There will be a reabsorption of the sodium uh, bicarb, and also uh, uh, that is an exchange of with chloride, okay, and two potassium molecules. Uh, also, there is another cause, which is the reduced pancreatic juice, um, and uh, pancreatic juice usually is uh, bicarbonate rich, uh, and this will lead to increase of the bicarbonate. We mentioned about the paradoxical acidoria. The paradoxical acidoria as hypovolemia will lead to stimulation of the angiotensin aldosterone system, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, and this will lead to salt and water retention. And this in exchange between hydrogen and potassium from the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. And consequently, the patient will have a paradoxical acidoria. All right? So the patient will probably have hyponatremia. So a metabolic alkalosis, which is the patient ABG, the kidney can excrete more of NaHCO3 to reduce the blood alkalinity, and this might cause hyponatremia. Management, usually in this particular condition, we're worried about hypokalemia and dehydration, to start the patient on normal cell line and also potassium supplementation. Bedside procedure we can do, we can in, insert an NG tube to decompress the stomach and prevent aspiration as well, and the urinary catheter, and obviously I will definitely put an IV line as well on the start of the patient on fluid. We can involve in, in the care the ITU registrar and the surgical registrar and the gastroenterologist. This will take us to some of the, um, you know, the uh, complications uh, or the, some of the electrolyte imbalance and the starting by the 
hyponatremia. So what is the clinical picture of hyponatremia? Hyponatremia, so sodium is mainly berrine related and potassium is likely to be heart related. So the sodium can lead to confusion and agitation or even seizure as well. The causes of hyponatremia, we have too many causes for hyponatremia and I would classify them into a dilutional hyponatremia. So basically you have the same amount of salt but very high amount of water instead. And we can have something called depletional hyponatremia and also we can mention another category which is an endocrinological causes. So for depletion on hyponatremia, you have increased loss of sodium, all right? And the increased loss of sodium can happen due to whether it's a renal loss, so from the kidney, or uh, whether it's um, a non-renal loss, all right? So the non-renal loss, that would be the gut and it can happen in diarrhea and vomiting. And the renal loss, this can happen in the diuretic phase of the renal failure or giving the patient any diuresis such as thiazide uh, medication or even spironolactone or whatever that the, the other thing is could be mannitol and so on and also maybe we can uh, chronic urinary obstruction as well can lead to that or osmal diuresis and i mentioned the non-renal cause which are the gut loss dilutional is basically due to accumulation of large amount of water this can happen in, in conditions with fluid overload that can happen in heart uh, failure all right in heart failure, so the patient will have fluid overload, and also in ascites due to liver failure, and maybe in kidney failure due to nephrotic uh, syndrome as well. On the other side, there is a condition called syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion due to production of antidiuretic hormone, and this will lead again to increase the amount of water and will lead to dilutional hyponatremia. The reason why I'm classifying them into SIADH and this one together, this will be hypervolemic hyponatremia and this will be a euvolemic hyponatremia, the same amount of blood volume. On the other side, we have endocrinological causes. We mentioned Addison's disease that can cause uh, this as well. You can talk about hypothyroidism and even hyperthyroidism can cause it as well. Um, but mainly Addison's and hypothyroidism. So these are the causes of hyponatremia, depletional hyponatremia, dilutional hyponatremia, and some other endocrinological causes as well. I didn't mention that in, in dilutional polydipsia with increased water intake can lead to that as well. And the TERP syndrome can also lead to this because the, um, the washout that we use in the TERP syndrome is, uh, uh, has less amount of sodium and can get absorbed and will lead to decrease in the sodium level. And we're discussing this later on as well. So in terms of hyponatremia diagnosis, so uh, we need to order a few investigations uh, and also we need to make it to be clinically oriented about the patient to clinical um, or dehydration status or the, the patient fluid status is the most important part in the diagnosis. So we start by doing the plasma osmolarity. The patient might be a hypotonic hyponatremia. Hypotonic hyponatremia Means, means that you have very few amount of sodium on very large pool of water, all right? Isotonic hyponatremia, which is the normal 280, so they are equilibrium to the normal level. And hypertonic hyponatremia, you have um, uh, more sodium and uh, less water, but still the sodium is relatively low in uh, the um, uh, serum. So starting by the, if, the, if you have hypo, hypotonic hyponatremia, you can do urine osmolarity, and this will define the fluid status for the patient as well. If urine osmolarity is less than 100, this is a polydipsia due to excessive water intake. If urine osmolarity is more than 100, which is a little bit increased, so that means the body is trying to compensate for that. And uh, it could be one of three things, whether it's a hypovolemic, patient is dehydrated, or euvolemic, same amount of um, uh, uh, blood volume is a serum volume and also hypervolemic of course hypervolemic we talked about it renal failure heart failure liver failure euvolemic again we explained it as well it's like siadh on the other side for hypovolemic hyponatremia could be to do renal loss and the patient will be dehydrated or the diuretic phase of renal loss on the other side if it's hyperosmolar that means the patient have taken a hyperosmolar fluid or hypertonic fluid such as mannitol or the patient himself is uh, hyperlysemic. So this is the way we're going to like investigate hyponatremia. Start by assessing the plasma osmolarity. 
and then the urine osmolarity, and then move into a set the fluid status of the patient, whether they are dehydrated or not. All right. So that is that was the um, gastric outlet obstruction and also the um, hyponatremia uh, causes and clinical picture. Thank you.